Hey guys, today we're down here at the river in order to show you some basic forging. Now these are going to be techniques and some food sources that don't require tools to get your hands on. So as long as you know what to look for and kind of have an idea of what techniques to use, you ought to be doing just fine. So the first technique is dealing with crawdads. I often call them crawfish. If you've seen some of my videos before, you know that I trap quite a few of these in my creeks. Today we're going without the trap and we are instead in the river. This is the San Antonio River. We're going after the Texas Devil Crawfish. Oftentimes I'm trapping the Red Swamp Crawfish, so different kind of crawfish, different setting, different technique. Now first and foremost, you need to actually go and locate a crawfish mound. So take a look here. You might have seen these down here in the south, around stock ponds, creeks, riverbeds, anywhere there's a little bit of mud. Your crawdads, crawfish are going to dig down, especially when the water starts to recede. And they're going to tunnel down, 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 straight down to the earth until they get to that water line. Now as they're tunneling, they build these chimneys. And uh, as they go down and pull up more and more mud, they clump it over and this thing will continue to get taller and taller. From an inch high up to eight or nine inches. Uh, different species, different design, different style, but most of them are pretty easy to recognize. Now the plan or rather the trick here is going to be digging down and not hitting any roots uh, or any hard pack. As for technique, hopefully we're fairly lucky. Now once you've located one of these mounds, all you really have to do is start digging and using your hands. Hopefully you got some good clay and that there's not too many roots or rocks in the way. Now most years we're going to have a pretty easy time at picking out mounds that are in some soft clay or not in very many roots. This year we don't have too many to choose from. Populations are always in flux. But let's go ahead and at least show you what this is about. So the mounds should just come undone and apart. And it works just like that. All right, go ahead and put those down. And from there, you just kind of hope that it's soft enough. and you start to dig. All right, check out what we've done. I'm gonna have to go ahead and call this one though. We've dug down, we're hitting roots, it's hard pack. So crawfish one, bob zero. Again, a lot of this comes down to location. He is down there, he's just too hard to get at. And that's one of the reasons why he's one of the holdouts. He's surviving, he dug it in the right place and uh, more power to him, he wins. I'm going to try this one more time. I'm going to at least show you how far you need to dig into a mud wall in order to actually pull one of these guys out. But, uh, yeah, I won. Take a look at this crawfish mound. Now it's a little bit smaller. Hole's about the same size. But what I want to show you here is that if you track down this bank, take a look at this hole down here. Now this is an access tunnel. Now, a lot of these will actually uh, beat into and split off into other tunnels. Uh, other crawfish dens will dig into them. Uh, some of the sidewalls here are just littered with holes. And so that's going to make it a little harder to grab onto your crawfish or crawdad, depending on how many of these you have around. But sometimes you can start digging here, dig up, or dig back and skip the mound itself. Okay. All right, I'm gonna have to admit defeat. Suffice to say, the years that it's easy to dig these guys out, they make a pretty good meal, either over the fire, or a lot of people like to boil them, or as bait. Crawfish mound is definitely something to look twice at. Well, crawdads aren't happening this year, but for every population that's ebbing, hopefully you have one that is flowing. And right here below me, I'm going to be showing you a different food source. This is going to be clams, mussels, things that most people overlook or don't even know to look for. But uh, this is definitely the year of clams and mussels. So what I'm going to do is run my hands through the mud. I haven't set this up at all. This is just an amazing year. But I'm going to start pulling up 
different kinds of clams. And I usually have uh, four different types of populations expressed in this area. These are your washboard clams. Take a look. It took me all of 10, 15, 20 seconds to pull in that much protein. And that's as easy as it can be some years. I'm just skimming my fingers through the mud and filling the top ridges of the clams. Well, here's another one. And this is a different type. Maybe putting this right back in just a moment. But I pulled that out to uh, kind of tell you about it for a moment. This is a threatened species right here. So you want to know what you're looking for. If you're out practicing survival skills, you want to know uh, what's protected and what's not. So you're not pulling up things that are going to get you in trouble or things that are going to impact a population. So we're pushing that right back in there. You need to do your homework when it comes to uh, procuring your clams and mussels. Ask your game warden if you need to. But uh, ignorance is not something that's going to work. Uh, if you're pulling it out and you're eating these things or damaging the habitat, you're going to get in trouble. So ask questions and uh, know what you're doing. Now, as I'm pulling these out, it's as easy as just skimming my fingers through the mud. So I'm taking my fingers through and I'm raking back. Now most of these are going to be pretty much aimed straight up just like this. Uh, this, my fingers are going to be simulating where the mud stops. So this is the level of the ground and I'll just kind of feel the tops of these. So you might imagine these can be pretty sharp if you don't have water shoes on and you're not as careful you can go ahead and you can cut open your heels pretty easy especially with the number of clams I'm finding right now. So you want to be very very careful. Now, different places with different amounts of sand or clay or roots, you're going to find different types of clams. So as I get into kind of a gravel hard pack, some more and more of those washboards, I might be able to find uh, what's called a golden orb, which is also one you do not want to go ahead and collect. Once you get the feel down, you'll know what not to pull up. Uh, in the roots, in the gravel, I'll find what are called mini clams. And those don't usually get larger than a quarter. I uh, found one. This is going to be a really tiny one. But I'm going to go ahead and show it to you. That is a mini clam. And uh, you've got to collect a heck of a lot more of those. But if that's what you have, that's what you have. And that can get up to about the size of a quarter. And you'll find quite a few of them. Once you find one, you'll find more. I've been asked uh, just how far ranging do I have to go in order to find these guys. Uh, this year, all the way up to the bank. So, up here. I'll say that. Here we go. All the way up next to the bank. I'm finding them. That's within five inches of the water level. Push them back down in there. And uh, some years I can be... Oh down to my ankles up up to my up to my neck pulling these guys out so fairly deep uh, past that you're not going to find too many of them uh, on the good years whenever you pull catfish in you'll find that their stomachs are going to be full of those mini clams a lot of times and they're going to be hunting for them so it's uh, also a pretty good bait now to prepare these you can cut into them uh, it's going to be a, a fairly unsafe thing, but if you have a fairly sharp knife, a uh, very thin blade, you can just kind of bisect and cut back, and that will release the muscles, and it will open up, and you can get a hold of that meat, uh, either to use as bait to trap something else or to catch it fishing. Uh, the easiest way to cook this is going to be just to put it next to the fire, and uh, once it gets hot enough, it will actually open up, and you can get at that meat and stick it on a stick. And I would do that to keep yourself from using that knife and potentially slicing your hands open. Because that's definitely, definitely a danger. Uh, other people will boil these up one way or another. This is just really easy food. Even in the middle of winter, I can go ahead and start my fire up on the bank. I can come down here and pull out quite a few clams really fast. And uh, I can have food whenever I need it. Especially if I'm just really bad at fishing. And 
go ahead and put these things back. But you'll never know unless you look. Uh, also, don't stop the first place you look. Go up and down the river. Some years, it takes uh, quite a bit of looking. Check the clay, check the sand. Um, it just seems that we're in a, in a year that just has a ton of them. And that's luck. So take care of your species. These are filter feeders. Uh, the more clams we have, the better. That means that we've got some healthy waters. That's what we want. So uh, good food in abundance. That's what you want to find. But if you don't know to look, yeah, it's dark. So this drift of leaves and trash does not look like much on first inspection. But if you pay close attention here, look at this greenery. This is actually called duckweed. If you know anything about duckweed, and you can positively identify it, it's worth straining out, it's worth cooking, it's actually a superfood. Lots of protein, lots of calories. If it comes down to it, it's worth taking the time to actually strain this out and get enough of it to make a meal out of. Now if you also check, take a look in between the parts and pieces. Some of them are quite small, but there are little snails all throughout. Every once in a while, like this one right here, you find one that's uh, <laughs> almost bite-sized. And it doesn't seem like much, but if you're down to the point where you're straining out duckweed to survive, you might as well throw in some escargot. It's going to be a little crunchy because he's not quite large enough to pull out uh, just to get the meat out. So cook him up, chew the whole thing. But uh, beggars can't be choosers at this point. Food is food. So back here behind me is an important feature. This is where a creek is flowing out to join the main body of the river. Now whenever you find a landmark like this, it's worth exploring further, especially when you're surviving and foraging. Walking up a creek like this, a lot of times you're going to find secluded pools. Whenever the river comes up, your big monster fish will travel up the creek and many times they'll get stranded whenever the water comes back down. It's worth looking for. Also, creek beds, they're transit areas. You're going to find lots of turtles moving back and forth. Whenever they're up on land or in shallow water, they're easy to run up on, they're easy to grab. It's meat, it's there, it's worth taking a look. I also find, as a rule of thumb, uh, more chances, more times than not, I find lots and lots of nut and berry trees on the insides of these creek inlets. So whenever the river comes up and floods, that water is rising up and moving down. Uh, the river can rise up to about 45 feet here. So 45 foot above my head in a big flood. But the idea is that since this creek is going back at a diagonal, this landmass right here that grows and grows protects this area over here from the main brunt of the flood. So we have lots of wild pecan and mulberry back here that get all the benefit of the river water and creek water, but they don't get all the force and all the brutality of a flood. So whenever you find a creek inlet, go ahead and explore it further. This tree I've got a hold of is called a willow tree. And there are several different types, all of them very useful. Not so much for eating, you're not really going to get the nutritional value out of it, but for making things. Now if you've got the skill and you've got the time, willows can be used to fashion baskets. So if you can weave baskets, you have a container. Also, as it were, you're going to find your willows around streams, rivers, watercourses. They can be used to make fish traps, and where you have a fish trap, you already have your source of fish. So uh, they come hand in hand. If you have the skill, if you have the time, go ahead and use them. Not only that, one of the most useful things willows can be used for is pain reliever. So if you get up there in the larger branches and you cut into that bark, chew some of that inner bark up, it's going to be just like taking some aspirin. And that can be incredibly, incredibly useful. So this is going to be the last place I show you for today. And if I were in a survival situation, I'd definitely be looking for a place that had features just like this. Namely the gravel and rock over here. It's excellent building material. But not only that, we have the river getting quite shallow. But for me, I'm a trap builder. So spending hours, a half day, maybe more, building all kinds of fish traps all throughout here, the investment would definitely be worth it in the long run. If you find yourself in a survival situation, you might as well plan on being here for the long term. 
and uh, something that continues to catch and catch and catch without much effort, that's where my money would be. Not only that, but day and night, being out here in the water, maybe sharpening some sticks and being ready to spear something, fish will move up and down throughout the river, and uh, you want to be ready, you want to be prepared at night time, and we've done this a few times, you can actually get out here and tickle the fish. They can see you during the day, they're very skittish, take away that light, you come up under the fish, throw them up on bank, it's worth a try. So uh, you definitely want to keep your options open. Now, some of y'all might call me on this, but I didn't noodle in this river. Uh, noodling is a possibility, sticking your arm up under a bank, hoping that something's going to grab a hold of it like a big catfish. That'll work in some water courses, some waterways. I've done it all up and down this place. Doesn't happen in the San Antonio River. Um, I've stuck my hand in all kinds of uh, places that it shouldn't be. And nothing's grabbed on thus far, nothing's moved. So uh, you just kind of have to try things out, see what works. You never know where you're going to find yourself. But guys, hopefully, hopefully y'all have enjoyed this. Like, subscribe, give me some comments, and uh, as always, till next time. That is a very tired and happy puppy. Quite fitting. His name's actually Huckleberry. So spending a day out in the water is pretty apt.